let's look at an awesome and fairly obscure Indian sword, the Sozampata. Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator and Easton Antique Arms. Now, many of you will know I'm an antique sword dealer, amongst other things, and therefore I come across lots of really interesting antique weapons, and I feature a lot of them on this channel under my Obscure Weapons series. So this one is an Indian sword. Now, just for anyone who doesn't know, and I'm sure most watch, regular watchers anywhere of this channel will know, the typical Indian sword uh, for basically the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th, and 20th centuries is the Talwar or Talwar. Little comment briefly on the uh, spelling of that. Obviously it's translated from uh, Indian languages, so how we write it in English is variable. It's usually written either Talwar with a U or Talwar with an A. I often get corrected on this, but if we look at historical documents from the 19th century, you can see the usual spelling, at least in British sources, is Talwar, uh, and occasionally Talwar. Anyway, doesn't really matter, it's a sword, and that's just the Indian word for sword. Now this was the typical Indian sword that was essentially came into India with the Mughals, uh, Mughals in the uh, 16th century. And uh, certainly by the 18th century, it was just absolutely the typical Indian sword. However, you might be wondering, what came before that? Uh, well, in fact, so the idea that this curved sabre blade is a typically Indian thing, in fact, it was from the 16th, 17th century onwards, but India is one of the most diverse areas for sword designs. And actually, if we look at Indian swords which predate the 16th century, so essentially in what would be the medieval period in Europe, the majority of them are actually straight or flared ended, like a kandar, or forwards curved. And actually, this is where we get the uh, Nepalese or Gurkha cookery from. And I'm sure most of you know, but for anyone who doesn't know, this is a Nepalese, Nepal's just to the north of India, uh, cookery. So the cookery develops out of earlier types of sword and knife that were around in the Indian subcontinent. And other Indian swords developed from those as well. And one of the swords that develops from these earlier medieval era swords that go all the way back to kind of 1000 AD is a forwards curved type of blade known as the Sozan Pata. So as you can see, the Sozan Pata has a forwards curve. It curves forwards like this and then recurves slightly at the tip. In fact, there's some variation. Don't worry about me touching the blade instantly. I clean these off after the videos. Um, there is some variation in the forms of them, and some of them seem to be related to the Yatagan. Now, the Yatagan is a type of uh, forwards recurved um, knife or short sword that was very popular in the Ottoman Empire, was also used in Persia to some extent as well. Uh, Persia via Afghanistan has connections with India, and a lot of weapons came into India via that connecting point. Okay, so we see things like Pesh cabs um, and even the Talwar itself has influence from Persia. So we often refer in this field of study to Indo-Persian weapons because the connecting tissue between Indian weapons and Persian weapons, Persia incidentally is modern Iran, um, although Persia used to be bigger, um, is, is very strong. There's a strong connection between Persian, Afghan, Nepalese and Indian uh, weapons, and also areas like uh, Sri Lanka as well. So in fact, the origin of the Sozampata is not necessarily linear, not necessarily simple. Indeed, it might be, and probably is in my view, related to earlier India, Indian swords, which go all the way back to 1000 AD, possibly even earlier, which are forwards curved and also give rise to things like the kukri and other forms of sword that we see in India, uh, and knife as well. But it's possible, and I think, I think it's also strongly possible that certain forms of Sozampata, because they don't all look exactly the same, certain forms of Sozampata, particularly ones with a T section back, uh, and if you look at their overall shape, are it seem to be extremely closely related to the um, Ottoman Yatagan um, uh, via, and again, via the kind of Persian connection. So I think there are two things. One, there's a pre-existing sword which looks a bit like this in India, and then there's influence via Persia of these Yatagans. And so I think what we end up is a group of swords which are now known as the Sozanpata swords, uh, which fundamentally date to usually the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. So this is probably a 19th century example. Um, 
I don't think it's earlier than that, but it's possible it's 18th century, but I think it's probably 19, early 19th century. Um, and there are a group of swords which look fundamentally similar, but they have variations. They don't all have the same degree of curvature. They don't all have the same type of tip. This has actually got a rather unusual tip, and I'll talk about that in a second. Now, as well as having different types of blades, and we'll come back to the blade in a minute, uh, these often come with different types of hilts. And uh, now uh, there's various types of hilts, but the most common two types of hilts are this type of hilt, which is commonly referred to as a towa hilt which just means sword hilt, uh, but nevertheless, because this type of um, hilt is usually found on the type of sword that we refer to in modern collecting circles as a tolwa, we refer to this as a tolwa hilt. And generally speaking, these are more associated with areas with Islamic um, populations or influence, but not always, you do find these in all parts of India. And the other type of hilt we find is a basket hilt. Now, a, a so-called Hindu basket hilt, as British writers of the 19th century describe it. Now, the basket hilt is a very old type of hilt that goes all the way back uh, to the 16th century in India. And the basket hilted versions of Sozampata seem to be particularly associated with the Rajputs. The Rajputs being one uh, cultural grouping um, and essentially empire. Okay, so prior to the Europeans, not just the British, but the Dutch, the Portuguese and others turning up in, uh, in India, India was essentially divided up into lots of rival kingdoms and empires, the Sikhs, the Rajputs, the Marathas, the Mughals, and they were all sometimes at various points either allies or enemies of each other. But anyway, um, so you do get different style hilts, you get different style blades, and overall you get different styles of Indian sword that are more or less associated with certain empires, nations, cultural groups within India. So the Susan Pata, Susan Pata is found all over India. Some sources will say it's particularly found in the north. I don't think that's necessarily true. You can certainly find ones in the south. My, overall, I'd say you can find the Sozan Pata all over India, and I think it was a common type of, or it's really related to a common type of Indian sword that was around before that. So hilts, usually either a talwar hilt like this, or a basket hilt, um, if, particularly if it's a Rajput example. Now, back to the blade. So. Let's look at its features. So very simply, it is a forwards curved recurve blade. This gives you an enormous amount of chopping power, but also it has the beauty of having the edge leading forward of the main cutting axis, as talked about in application to Yatagan blades by Colonel Mary Mong, the French cavalry officer, uh, in his book, A Memoir on Swords, which if you haven't read, I highly recommend it. Um, so it has an axe-like chopping ability, because if you think about an axe, the uh, shaft is more or less sticking up in a straight line, might have a bit of a curve to it, but usually straight line-ish, and the blade is forwards. That means that you're hitting in front of the, um, the lever of, of, of motion, and you get a similar effect with this type of blade. It's enormously chopping if you want to chop. But of course, there are other ways of using swords. If you push cut or draw cut, it also means because of this scooped edge, it is naturally going to cut into with a push or cut into with a pull because of this crescent-like angle down here. So very good for push cuts, draw cuts, and chops. And it has the really nice benefit of having this dropped shape here. It still keeps the point in line with the hand, which means it's also good for thrusting. So we often talk about curved blades like... Um, Shamshir or uh, Tolwa or you know sabers essentially. The problem with them thrusting is that the point is very offline with the hand, which means that the energy is diverted. It's more difficult to apply the point. Blah blah blah. With this, the point is essentially it's offset slightly, but it's essentially still in line with the hand, such that you can give a straight direct thrust, um, either overhand or underhand with it, and it will have a lot of penetrating power. Now, this specific example that thrusting potential is particularly interesting because much like the Qatar punch dagger, which I showed recently on this channel, you will notice, hopefully, that this also has a reinforced point, which is really, really cool. Um, so it's literally thicker here than it is down here. So it swells up a bit like a spearhead or an arrowhead which means that it's essentially a reinforced point, which means that whoever made this sword, presumably in the 18th, 19th century, was thinking about penetrating armor, specifically chainmail. So the standard default metallic armor in India, right the way up to the, even the early 20th century, was mail or chainmail. 
So this is specifically designed for bursting open rings in mail or punching through padded textile armors, which were also worn, even things like leather and stuff as well. Um, not so much for punching through steel plate. Uh, plate armor did exist in India, but wasn't worn a huge amount. Um, partly to do with the weather, probably partly for other reasons as well. So, the remarkable things about this blade is that not only is it a Sozampata, which is a fairly rare type of sword, um, in this period anyway, fairly rare type of sword, but it has a reinforced tip, which is pretty unusual to find on a Sozampata. Most Sozampata have a T-section and are more like a Yatagan and don't recurve quite as much as this. But the eagle-eyed amongst you may have also noticed there is something else pretty unusual about this blade. And that is that it has sections of serrations. Okay, so it's got, it's serrated from here to here and from here to here. Why? Well, we'll come back to that in a second. I will also point out that you notice on the back, it might look like it's serrated, but actually it's not. This is just a uh, decorative file work. And then you've got a thin filler at the back here. And also notice you have essentially a ricasso section that's completely blunt. That is often referred to in collecting circles as the Indian ricasso, because Indian blades often have a ricasso on them. And usually the ricasso ends about level with the langets of the hilt here. Um, the hilt is glued on, incidentally. It's glued on with um, pine pitch resin glue, um, which can be freed with uh, heat and a new hilt put on or a new blade put on. So often you find hilts and blades interchanged. Right, so serrations. The simple fact is a lot of people talk about serrations and I think there's a lot of unknowns. So I'm not going to say anything too certain. Why do people want serrations on their blades sometimes? Sometimes maybe to cut through fabric, to cut through silk more effectively than a standard straight edge. Uh, sometimes just because it looked cool, looked more fearsome, looked more scary, uh, more decorative. Sometimes I have found anecdotal mentions in period sources to serrated blades being associated with hunting. And I actually find that quite compelling because based on looking at original Indian swords of which hundreds have passed through my hands, a lot of hunting swords with hunting scenes um, engraved on the blade have serrated blades. In fact, I have another one, which I'll probably show in a future video quite soon. Um, and so therefore, and why would this be the case? Well, when you're fighting something like a tiger, and this is, they literally did, they went out and hunted tigers with a sword, uh, a tiger or a wild boar or a leopard, or you know this big kind of scary animal that can totally take you apart, there is some anecdotal evidence that serrated blades were reckoned at being better for that. Either maybe because it causes more pain and is more likely to make the animal back off, or maybe because it cuts through fur or hide better. We don't really, there's lots of different theories, but there does seem to be a concrete relationship between a serrated blade and hunting rather than necessarily war. Does that mean this is a hunting sword? Maybe, I don't know, I don't really know. Um, I don't really know. Uh, but we've got a simple edge here, and we've got just above up here, we've got, I think, the thrusting point. So the thrusting point doesn't have serrations. The serrations start after that, and then this part of the edge is simple. And there is edge damage on this sword from another sword. So it might have been used in combat, um, I don't know. And the hilt's a fair size. You'll also notice, just briefly, the hilt looks silvery, and that is because it's silver. <laughs> um, and this is called koftgari, and it's where you put, you scratch little lines in the surface of the iron hilt, and then you hammer on steel, uh, sorry, you hammer on silver um, sheet, uh, which, which then kind of mashes into the grooves in the iron, and bites in and stays there as a sheet. Um, and obviously we've got uh, floral, decoration on that hilt as well and it's in pretty good condition and we've even got it on the end there so uh, silver plated obviously with silver plate it's not going to rust and also it looks more shiny it looks more fancy it's more high status this isn't a super high status weapon the highest status ones have gold kofgari and woots blades this is not a woots blade and it's silver kofgari so this is what i would call a well-to-do middle-class person's uh, sozenpata but sozenpata are rare swords especially with that reinforced tip and especially with serrations. So there we go, another obscure weapon covered in my series. Uh, check out the others if you haven't done already. Um, the Indian Sozampata fearsome and rare sword. If you can get your hands on one, I highly recommend having one because they're really cool things. And this is quite a heavy, choppy sword. Um, and yeah, I hope I'll see you back on the channel really soon. I have been Miss Matt Easton and I will be again next time as well. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. 
please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.